Uh, so I just want to say hey, welcome to everyone uh, to our inaugural Open Science Grid Campus Infrastructures web meeting. Uh, for those who don't know me, I think I know most everyone, but for those who don't, uh, my, name's, my name is Rob Gardner. I'm a senior research scientist at the Computation and Enrico Fermi Institutes at the University of Chicago. And apart from my work on Open Science Grid, I also manage the U.S. Atlas Computing Facilities Integration Program, which includes the five Tier 2 centers and the Tier 1, uh, integrating with the Tier 1 at Brookhaven. Uh, so overall, in Open Science Grid, that, that's uh, 11 sites. Um, as you might know, in Open Science Grid, we have a vibrant and growing activity around various aspects of building and uh, using campus grids, or generally what we call campus infrastructures. For, high, for distributed high throughput computing. And uh, here we, uh, we are um, uh, attempting to build a community outreach effort here. So uh, for folks who are interested in this, in this um, kind of activity, so the Campus Infrastructures Community, or the OSG CIC for short, is meant to be an open forum to exchange knowledge, expertise, tools, and best practices um, uh, for high throughput computing infrastructures and enabling applications and research communities that are using them. And so all are welcome to attend, uh, regardless of how one works or what their roles are. If you're more on the end user side, welcome, or um, on the infrastructure providing side, or some other role or some place in between. So um, in this meeting series, we're planning on having both face-to-face um, -face meetings and web meetings. So we had our first face-to-face -face meeting at UC Santa Cruz last month. Um, and I'll drop a URL uh, to that uh, meeting uh, in the chat window at some point. Um, so if you miss that meeting, um, you might consult that. There's, there's a very interesting program of presentations, and um, we will have the opportunity to uh, follow up on many of those topics and um, areas uh, at the next, uh, the next OSG All Hands meeting. So uh, at that meeting, which is uh, the week of March 11th in Indianapolis, there will be a day Tuesday of that day of that week, uh, March 12th, will be devoted to um, to uh, campus infrastructures. So that's the OSG uh, campus infrastructures community. Um, today's speaker is Dan Bradley from University of Wisconsin Madison, um, where he's worked in various capacities. Among them, of course, the high energy physics group. Um, he's a member of the HT Condor team and the CMS Any, Any Data project. Um, I've known about Dan's work for a number of years, having crossed paths in various OSG meetings or visits to Madison. And I've always been impressed with his uh, approach and depth of technical knowledge uh, for solving high throughput computing problems. So today he's going to share with us work he's done providing tools for remote software and data access. And so um, I will turn the floor over to Dan. But um, just uh, one note, if we can uh, perhaps organize this uh, meeting such that we listen to his presentation and um, we can ask questions at the end. But uh, perhaps along the way, we can, we can um, type questions, if you want, into the chat window. And then we can review those. Um, uh, at the end, and, and hopefully uh, have Dan answer as many of these as, uh, as time permits. OK, so uh, Dan, the floor is yours, and, and uh, go ahead. OK, wow, thanks for that introduction, Rob. I'll jump right into it. We're talking about um, how CVMFS could benefit a campus grid and how it has benefited ours. Um, briefly how you could go about installing the Fuse client for CVMFS, um, how you could use it in a non-root environment where you don't administer the machine. Um, an example of 
uh, a Glide and WMS plugin that provides convenient access to it. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the existing repositories that are out there, and then also um, how you could go about uh, hosting your own if you needed to. And then um, finally, some best practices uh, that we've um, kind of come up with after stumbling around in the dark a bit. So what is CVMFS? It's a network file system. It provides a read-only POSIX interface via Fuse. Um, it fetches files on demand via HTTP. It verifies the data integrity, so the uh, network does not have to be trusted that the data is uh, being transferred over. And it does a lot of aggressive caching because it's, um, by design, it's basically read-only access, so it's kind of the simple case where everything uh, can be cached, both on the local disk um, where the client is running and also in web proxies in between the client and the server. So um, why is this well suited to a campus grid? It's easy to scale. The local disk cache, at least in our experience, um, has a pretty high hit rate because a typical uh, work workload will hit the same files over and over. Um, but you can also add more web proxies as needed to um, prevent the server from getting overloaded by requests. It can be made highly available uh, using kind of standard web techniques. They're just st uh, static web files are being served. So you can uh, um, mirror those uh, in, a, in separate uh, HTTP servers that can be distributed as is convenient for your situation. And the clients will automatically fail over to those and can even work in offline mode where they have no access to any repository and only can uh, serve up files that are in their local cache. It also, as I mentioned, uh, provides secure access over untrusted networks to the software files. You don't have to worry about uh, man-in-the-middle attacks uh, modifying your software as it's being transferred. And it works pretty well across administrative domains, um, including um, access from environments where you don't even uh, have uh, system administrator privileges. So a little truth in advertising here. CVFS is a young project. It's still undergoing active development by a small team of uh, people, primarily at CERN. And so you have to set your expectations accordingly. Uh, you know, we've, we've encountered bugs uh, over the last year of our usage of it. And uh, some parts are less well used uh, than others. For example, the server component has pretty much only been used at CERN. So um, we found it had more rough edges, as you'd expect, than the client, which has been used uh, quite a bit more broadly by, for example, almost all of the LHC sites. So to uh, install the Fuse client, you just need to install uh, an RPM, tell it which HTTP proxies to use so that it you wouldn't want it to directly access the um, CVMFS server uh, without a proxy, or you'd end up overloading the servers. Uh, you also need to allocate some local disk space for it to cache files, and then uh, tell it which repositories you want to access. And um, there's two different sources for RPMs. The OSG uh, site that I have linked there on the slide has um, excellent documentation about how to go through the process of setting up a client using the OSG uh, repository. And I was going to walk through that, but I um, didn't throw that together at the last minute. So I will let you try that out on your own if you are interested. So what if you are not uh, root? 
and you still want to access a CVMFS repository. Um, a solution for that is to use the Parrot virtual file system. It works as a job wrapper, so um, you, you invoke Parrot and then whatever program you want to run, which can include a whole uh, tree of processes, and Parrot will intercept the system calls made by those processes and uh, when they try to access CVMFS, it will use its built-in uh, CVMFS client. And so I can show you an example of how to do that. I'll just pop over here. I'm hoping you all can see my uh, terminal now. Yep. So I'm going to download Parrot from the CC Tools website. Parrot is a part of the CC Tools uh, project, which is um, basically Doug Fain's um, work. Various um, useful tools that he's thrown together. I'm going to untar that. And I'm going to point my path into the bin directory that's in that uh, folder that I got. So now parrot run is in my path. If I tried to use it uh, right now to access CVMFS, little example command here. It will fail because um, I have not set up a, a proxy for it to use. There's a way to get around that so that it won't require a proxy, but I won't tell you how to do that because it's probably not a good idea. And so now, um, I can run a command that um, accesses CVMFS. Uh, the repository I'm accessing is one of the ones that's hosted at CERN. Those are uh, support for those is built in uh, by default into Parrot. I could also run something a little more complicated, like uh, Bash. And now I'm inside of a shell that is running under Parrot. And I can go ahead and, um, why don't I? actually set up my environment. To use this uh, software that's installed in this repository. So now the LCGCP command, for example, which I could use to copy files. Um, using grid protocols is, is now coming from the, from that repository. And it seems to execute all right. So that's the sort of thing you can do. There's a lot of magic going on there. Parrot is intercepting system calls. Um, one question is, how's, how much is this going to slow things down? Uh, we did some tests of that uh, for CMS jobs, which if you'll notice in the graph are running for um, you know, over an hour. And um, in, in that kind of uh, situation for our application, we don't really see a significant slowdown. Uh, the, Standard answer for Parrot is um, it costs it gives you about a five percent performance hit, so that would be a good assumption. Uh, but if you have very short jobs, you may find um, that the startup cost is fairly significant, and that could have to do with how uh, the files are cached. Uh, by default, Parrot the Parrot puts the CVMFS uh, local disk cache in a directory in temp. I can probably look at that here. Um, 
So here, there's a whole bunch of files and CMFS directory within there, and you can see that it's cached things for various different repositories I've accessed. If I were to remove all of that, I'll just remove the whole cache. Now, when I um, when I try to access that same repository. Well, I guess it was still pretty fast, um, so that doesn't show, but for uh, some repositories, you'll see a noticeable uh, delay while it has to download um, the whole uh, file catalog. Let me try a bigger one. There we go. So the CERN uh, repository, the CMS uh, repository has probably a lot more files than that one, so there was, you know, a few seconds pause while it Start it up. Uh, one thing to note is that only one instance of Parrot can be using that um, the, the cache directory at a time, and so if you're running uh, multiple jobs per machine, then you'll definitely want to point Parrot at a, a different path to use. For example, you could give it a directory inside the jobs, um, the per job temp directory that maybe the batch system sets up. So uh, comparing how Parrot caches files to a Fuse case, um, Fuse will be sharing the cache between um, all the processes that are accessing CBMFS on the, on the machine, whereas if uh, you have many instances of Parrot running, they'll each have their own cache. So that could uh, add up to a bit more bandwidth and disk space used. And also, if you're throwing the cache away after each job runs, then um, for very short jobs, you may end up noticing a bigger startup cost. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, what you could do about that later. Uh, one limitation of the Parrot implementation is it, it doesn't have, um, we don't have a great way of implementing support for multiple access to multiple repositories in the same um, Parrot session. So that feature is disabled by default, but it is possible to do it if you need to. Um, and if, it, if your application is sort of uh, spending a lot of time accessing one repository and then uh, rarely switching between um, to access some other repository, then I would expect it to be behave all right. And to enable that, you just need to set this environment variable. So if I were to I were to first access the CMS uh, CERN repository and then try to access the grid repository. I'll get an error message uh, basically telling me that I have to enable that to feature if I want it. So by default, Parrot knows about the CERN repositories. You can configure it to access um, other repositories if you have um, some other one that you want to access. Uh, so in this example, um, you could set an environment variable that will inform uh, Parrot about some other repository. You give it a name, you give it a um, public key that it uses to check the um, validity of the catalog that it downloads, and you give it a URL of the server where it will find the files. And there's other options that you can read about in the Parrot manual. Uh, for example, you can set a limit on the quota for the cache that it has. So here's a use case uh, that kind of matches how we've been using uh, CVMFS, and that is on, on, on the machines we control, we have fuse-mounted CVMFS, and then we also um, export 
excess jobs from our campus out to opportunistic resources on OSG. And uh, we do that via Glide-In. And so we would like to just have the jobs experience a uniform environment where CVMFS is just available and they don't have to do anything uh, different in those two cases. And so we achieved that with a wrapper, a kind of plug-in for Glide-In WMS. The job just needs to um, set an attribute, a custom attribute that says, I would like to have CVMFS and the um, and Glide in, uh takes care of setting that up automatically for them. Uh, one issue is that, well, the wrapper will try to use the site squid um, if possible, because that would be best for limiting uh, wide area network bandwidth requirements. But if uh, failing that, if the site squid um, is found not to work, then it can fall back to um, as a squid that is set up um, at your home site um, that could limit your total scalability and um, I don't know how to provide good access control in that situation. And so uh, there's a link there to the uh, Parrot Glide-In wrapper code in case you want to plug that into your own Glide-In um, setup. So there's two cases for how the uh, files get cached in this situation. If you're using GLXX, then the job and the Glide-In run um, as different users. And so in that case, we each job has its own disk cache, and that's deleted when the job exits. If you're not using GLXX, um, then at least in our case, it, we're happy with uh, having all the jobs share uh, the same cache. Each glide is only running one job at a time, but uh, successive jobs will be able to share that cache, and um, that can reduce the, the bandwidth requirements and the startup costs, since um, hopefully subsequent jobs will be hitting the same files. And one question here is, do we even need GeoExec? The, this job wrapper turns on a Parrot uh, feature called identity boxing. Uh, which basically provides you privilege separation between the job and the Glide-In. The job can't uh, mess with the Glide-In files. Um, and we've tried to think of different ways the job could attack the Glide-In, and um, we have gotten some features uh, added to identity boxing to prevent those attacks. But it's still not 100% trustworthy. Um, not because of Parrot's fault, but because um, our wrapper is running in user-controlled environment, and so there's some issues there where the user could kind of circumvent uh, the identity box. So that's still work in progress, but the basic idea um, seems to get rid of the need for GeoExec if it's just being done for privilege separation, at least in this situation. So here's an example of the uh, configuration file that we would use for this uh, plugin. So you can tell it, uh, first of all, what repositories you want to access and how you want to configure those. So in this example, I'm just saying um, include the default repositories, which are the ones hosted at CERN, and um, don't allow more than four gigs of data to be cached. And then um, if you have uh, central proxies that you would like it to use, if the uh, site squid proxy doesn't work, then those can be specified. And then you can give it some information that it uses to uh, validate uh, access to CVMFS when the glide-in starts up. And then finally, uh, you can tell it, should the glide-in consider it a a fatal error if it can't access CVMFS, or should it just basically advertise um, that it doesn't support CVMFS and continue in order to be able to run uh, jobs that don't need it? So here's an example of jobs that uh, you could submit in our campus grid um, in order to use this feature. The job just has a custom attribute that says, I require CVMFS, and 
that will instruct the, if it happens to land on a Glidin, that will instruct the Glidin to wrap the job in uh, inside Parrot. And from the job's point of view, it, it will uh, have access to CVFS wherever it lands. And so if I take a look at our Glidin pool, hopefully there's, there's usually a fair amount of activity there. And I'm going to say I want to just see Glidins that um, are, have successfully validated CVMFS and are able to run jobs that require it. And so there's a bunch of Glidins running at various OSG sites that um, have successfully done that and are ready to run jobs that need it. So what repositories are out there? Uh, the CERN repositories, basically there's one for each of the experiments that have uh, started using it, CMS Atlas and several others. There's a general grid repository that contains a bunch of GLite software. OSG is currently in the process of setting up a repository that's called the OASIS project. Uh, the idea there is uh, VOs will be able to publish files into this repository. And this is um, an alternative to the existing uh, practice of having to maintain those files in everybody's OSG app directory on all the target sites. And the hope is that this will be more convenient in the long run. And I think it will. Um, I'm not aware of uh, too many other repositories that are out there. In Wisconsin, we have a repository that we use um, as our implementation of OSG app because uh, we have, we allow jobs to come into OSG and then they can kind of flock around the campus and we tried various solutions for OSG app and we're not happy with the ones we tried and CBMFS seemed like a good fit since we could easily um, provide access to that from all the different uh, clusters on the campus where we would like the OSG jobs to be able to reach. Uh, from from the EO's point of view, it's just like any other OSG app. They write files there, and they're readable from the worker nodes. So if you needed uh, something that's not in an available repository, you could set up your own. You'd have to run the CBMFS server. It's a fairly lightweight service. It includes a kernel module to detect uh, updates to the uh, files that are to be published. It has a program that you can use to then uh, prepare those published files. It compresses the files and checksums them and produces the catalog. And then those are all just static files sitting in a directory uh, which are then served by um, Apache or whatever you want to use. Most of the I.O. is actually done by the web proxies. The server itself generally doesn't see a lot of direct access. And then to make it all highly available, you might also want to add a mirror server, which is just a, um, a copy of those static files. To manage the repository, um, in the simple case, I'm hearing music. Is that from somebody else? Is anyone else hearing that music? Yes, I was. I was. I was, I was muted. I was. Um, I was commenting. That was very soothing music, but right, fortunately, yeah, it has nice. been uh, muted. <laughs> okay. So, in the simple case, um, you just have a single user who is maintaining the repository. They can just update the software tree, um, and then when they're all done run a script to uh, do the publication. 
and the new files are packaged and then um, clients generally will will periodically check to see if there's a new version of the catalog so it could take an hour I mean you can configure things differently but by default it can take up to an hour for um, the clients that are out there to see the new files a more complicated case um, is for example our uh, implementation of OSG app with CVFS. There's many software maintainers. They don't know anything about CVFS and we don't want them to. Uh, so we don't want them to have to trigger the publication. So we've pr tried just periodically uh, triggering publication and we found that this caused long uh, delays or write errors uh, to the people who were trying to maintain their software. Um, so that was no good. Uh, so instead, we settled on just periodically R-syncing from the area where the software maintainers are writing to the actual uh, CVMFS software tree, what CVMFS calls the shadow tree. And uh, then uh, after we're done R-syncing, we publish uh, from that secondary uh, copy of the data into CVMFS. So in this way, the software maintainers are never blocked. The downside is we might publish um, software sort of halfway through an update. So far, that hasn't been a problem. So here's a little diagram of what goes on there. Uh, on our CVMFS server, we have um, basically three different copies of the files. There's the writable tree uh, where, that the software maintainers are writing to that gets r-synced into the CVMFS shadow tree and then that gets uh, copied published by the CVMFS server publish uh, script into the files that are then served via uh, Apache and then we periodically run CVMFS pull to sync those files over to a mirror server oh, could, you, could you take that And then um, on our CE, uh, we, that's where the um, software maintainers will be writing uh, to CVMFS. We just uh, NFS mount the writable tree into the same path where CVMFS is mounted on all the other nodes. And for various purposes, we also fuse mount uh, the read-only actual CVMFS repository under a, a different path on that machine. The worker nodes then uh, have a fused mount of uh, CVMFS and as I mentioned before we also have uh, machines out in OSG land where they are accessing it via Parrot. So that's the whole picture. Um, of course in the ideal case the, the uh, Parrot Access will have its own local squid at the site instead of falling back onto the squid servers in Wisconsin. So now I'll just talk uh, about some, a couple best practices uh, for using CBMFS in a, a Condor environment, but I think the ideas are more general and can be applied to other batch systems. So we always, whenever we deploy some new um, thing in our grid, we think about the problem of black holes, something going wrong and having it quickly fail all the jobs that are queued up to run. And in the case of CVMFS, that could happen if uh, the local disk cache is on a broken or full file system, maybe not enough space is allocated, or um, various things can go wrong. So um, it would be good to have something which is uh, testing the, um, the health of CVMFS on each node and we do that with a start decron job and that publishes information into the machine um, class add. Um, the basic thing that we get is, um, does, is CVMFS there? Does it work? And the expression that's actually published is slightly more complicated than just true or false because we want it to say it, it 
it works as of this time, and don't trust my answer if you haven't heard from me in an hour, because we ran into cases where uh, misbehaving auto mount stuff caused the script to um, get stuck and therefore not update the status. So that seems to work pretty well. And the job uh, just needs to say, I require a machine where CVFS has, is working. And you can uh, get a copy of that cron script if you want it uh, on the link that I stuck on this slide. It does a basic functional test. It monitors cache space, because on some of the machines um, where we put CVFS, we weren't able to allocate a dedicated partition for the cache. And so the concern there is that something else may chew up uh, the space, and CVFS uh, may run out of space when it tries to download files. And that can cause errors. And so it, it monitors for that condition. And then it also advertises the current catalog version. And that brings me to the, the last um, point, which is um, you could have a case where, for example, in our case, somebody could publish some files, in, write some files into our OSG app, and then submit jobs that are trying to use those files. And they could land on a machine that doesn't yet see them. And so that could cause errors. It's a race condition. So how can you avoid that? Um, we have our start cron job publishing the version of the CVMFS catalog that's available on each node. And on the submit machine, we just require that um, when the jobs are submitted, we require that the catalog version on the execute node be um, at least as new as the catalog that's visible on the submit machine. And for OSG jobs, we do that automatically in condor.pm. So an example job that would uh, use, use both these features I've talked about uh, would um, have to somehow find out the local CVMFS catalog version. And you can do that with the command that I've um, put on that slide. It would be nice if there were a way to call out to that from the condor submit file, but I couldn't think of a way to do that. And so the, then you can uh, use that in your requirements and also require that the health check has passed. And everything should work. Or if it doesn't, um, the problem should be discovered within a reasonably short time so that lots of jobs don't get sucked into the black hole. So that's the end of my talk. I have links. Um, to the various things that I mentioned throughout on that slide. So does anybody have any questions? <clears throat> Dan, thank you very much. That was uh, an interesting and excellent presentation. Um, let's see, so we had one question that came up during chat while you were speaking from Dave Dykstra. Dave, do you want to ask the question again if you're on audio, or I can read it off if you're? Sure. Uh, sure. So when you have uh, uh, the shared parrot cache for a uh, glide in, not using glug exec, couldn't uh, one user tamper yeah. with the cache and change the values for the next user? So it's so that's so that's the problem. Although you could probably could fix that and let the parrot prevent access to those files. And could, it knows that yeah, ideally it we would. It has control um, all the system calls. Actually, I'm forgetting if the yeah. But ideally, we would only share the cache between jobs of the same user. Um, in 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 our case, we've been happy to share glidins between different users from our campus grid anyway. So um, it doesn't, doesn't change our situation too much. But for some larger VOs, it might be more of a concern. So Dan, then you said users within your 
Campus Grid, do they use a, a separate um, OSG app repository, or are you, are you uh, just reusing that one available. for yeah, it's, it's your local community as well? We could set up a separate one, but um, we haven't needed to. Okay. Okay. Other questions? Yeah, that's a okay, good there's question. a question here from Matt. I, I'm, I'm not real familiar with the OASIS project, so maybe somebody else who is could answer whether um, if OASIS is to be useful, I would think that we would need all OSG sites to mount the OASIS CVMFS repository. But I don't know what the plans are for rolling that out. I would suspect it's going to be something that people want to do, but Brian is typing here, I see, so he'll have, he'll have a clear word on that. It will be optional but encouraged, is the answer. I mean, I mean, I suspect that, um, I mean, this will be something that will go through the usual break-in process on OSG sites. Um, and if, like most things, I think people will, you know, people will want to migrate to it and eventually you know, Dollar App will sort of go away. It'll probably still be there for a while, but yep. it'll probably find So if somebody out there use. really likes using it, um, the VO who's maintaining the software and really doesn't want to have to deal with sites that um, don't mount it, I guess they could fall back on something like this Parrot solution that I described. Okay, Dan, I had a question, which was um, you showed a really nice result with the CMS workloads, um, which basically suffer no parrot overhead penalty, um, negligible at least on the, the, the plots that you showed. Um, and you mentioned 5% um, was sort of a rule of thumb is what you've seen from, from VO. So uh, I'm wondering, have you seen any cases I, where there have been severe penalties that, or, you know, that we could advise people that, you know, if you are going to run in Paris, uh, please don't Sandra do, you know, X, Y, or Z. In the face-to-face -face meeting was showing some results that looked uh, quite severe in terms of the slowdown, and I'm curious if he there was some suggestion at the time that that was because it was mostly startup costs. They were very short jobs. And if that's the case, it's not surprising. But if, it, if it's something else, then that would be an example of what you're talking about. I don't know if he can comment on that now. I believe there were Mathematica jobs or something like that. So, so Chandra, are you... I see your mic. We're not hearing you, but uh, we. The sound not hearing you, but I do did see your mic, your microphone buzz. Okay, right. he's so typed down to the typing mode, so mostly startup costs. Sharing the cash between successive runs. Good. Especially if you don't yeah. have a lot of yes, true. And that have more of an the round trip time maybe. In your, uh, and uh, Brian is more more so than the, uh, those plots. And Brian points out that um, they have seen Java-based applications to have a fairly large penalty performance cost. Okay. Um, okay, so a question for Suchandra is how large of a cache should the switch servers have? Yeah. Um, well, it depends I mean, I on the application. We use, but. we use CVMFS for our, our main user here in Wisconsin is CMS. 
eventually we'll be transitioning over to using the CMS CERN repository, but right now we just have it in our OSG app. And, um, you know, five gigabytes is sufficient for our, our case. Okay. Um, I had maybe a question for someone else on the call, um, not necessarily Dan, but um, if this takes off as being something that we really like to do, I mean, it seems like this is a very nice template, um, you know, creating these um, parroted uh, environments. Um, sites don't have to worry about GLXEC. I would imagine that would be welcome news. Um, uh, uh, on the other hand, I mean, it does, um, I mean, well, I think most sites do have squid, but um, the question is, uh, do, we ha do we know if, uh, how many sites in OSG actually have squid servers deployed? I know it's been available there for a while, um, but I'm wondering if we have any recent survey results on that. In, in Anybody know? Well, we do have we do have um, monitoring of all the of all the known ones for the LHC. And just look at the names of sites. Which ones are OSG? Mm -hmm. It has a country code. If there's CMS, okay. We have country codes. There's, we have separate pages for Atlas. But uh, there, there's also a question of. Um, whether or not you want to share squids between opportunistic use and, and production use. So we, I think we, we want to recommend that sites who are going to have opportunistic users that coming in, you don't know what they're going to be doing with the squids. They could overload and, and interfere with the production job. So it be recommended that most sites should have two sets, one for Understood, well understood yeah, I mean, applications and one for everybody else. We have melted down mm -hmm. squid servers at some okay, sites and we feel terrible when that happens. So it would be nice if there was uh, some segregation. And uh, Brian notes here in the chat window that um, uh, this is something that the software technology group yeah, that would surveying be nice. and working on in the first quarter. Because at least in our the CMS year. case, so um, we we'll get an accurate. We also need Squid for our application to access conditions data, and in in my test so far, I found that many sites don't have a Squid that is compatible with uh, that. So I, I think this is an important thing for OSG to kind of make uniform across the sites if possible. Okay. Other questions? And uh, you mentioned briefly that there might be problem when sharing the local directory used by Parrot as a cache. But then you said that multiple uh, gliding's might use the same. So how, how does it work, this sharing exactly? Is it possible to reuse the same directory or not? Uh, parrot sessions that are running at the same time. So in our case, Glidens are only running. So how, how do you know? Yeah, so you need. Would it yeah, so in that case, Glidens, there Glidens might be multiple Glidens on the same uh, code. CVMFS cache. We don't share the cache between different Glidens. So yeah, basically, so you reuse it for multiple jobs running on the same gliding. Has there been any tests? To Has there been any tests about uh, possible modification to share uh, that directory? Or yeah, I'm, I'm not aware of any. Or no, not been tested. I'm not aware of anything. I see. So, so Dan, when you have um, uh, multiple jobs sharing the same 
glide in, do you mean that these are jobs running simultaneously or you're just sequentially uh, yeah, reusing? Okay. Got it. <clears throat> Okay. Any other questions for Dan now that while we have him here? I, we're just going to mention Dan. Um, we do have uh, at Midwest here too. Uh, Dave Lesney has set up a, uh, a CBMFS cache that we're using for dollar app for OSG. Oh. Um, I think in a manner similar to your diagram that you set up. Um, We've been doing that for quite a while, and that, that works nicely. And then um, we're also, uh, this is why I was asking a little bit about the, the overlap with Campus Grid. We're setting up a UC3 uh -huh. um, CBMFS uh, for our Campus Grid users as well. OK. Any final questions for Dan? Okay, I want to thank Dan again for preparing a nice talk. And uh, can, can you hear me, or I have to type? Ah, we definitely hear you. Yeah. So, um, Dan, I I may have missed it, but is there somewhere a list of the dangerous or downsides? Of, of all this, what are the things that can go wrong and have a negative impact on the yeah, infrastructure so by I, doing I put a all this hocus pocus? List of all the things in my talk, the best practices talk about things, bad things that can affect user jobs, but bad things that can affect um, the site. Would, in our experience, is pretty much um, the the possibility of overloading the network or the the squid proxies. So that's a good point. When there is a shared cache between multiple users, you also have the potential right. for one user to impact the other by kind of thrashing the cache as well. That's the fuse, uh, fuse mounted use case. So, Moran, I, I share your point. I mean, I think that with all of these services that... So, so I think... So go ahead. No, no, no you, you go ahead. Oh, I was just going to second your point. I mean, I, I think, you know, with any, with any service that we're, we're dealing with at sites, I mean, people are very keen, especially when they're putting putting in something new or using it. I mean, one thing that's kind of interesting is that um, I don't know if, Dan, for example, the sites that you, the uh, sorry, the jobs, the opportunistic jobs you run um, as part of GLOW that reach us at Midwest Tier 2, if those are using our local squid or not. Um, I mean, it's been sort of transparent. We've had just a couple of uh, cases which I think were unrelated to any of this uh, with uh, with glow jobs, but for the most part, I think a lot of this these workloads have sort of come through, and you know we yeah, were none the wiser. Uh, the, so the glide in wrapper advertises whether it ended up um, using the local site squid or falling back on the central one. So we can kind of monitor the the status of how that's um, working. But admittedly, we haven't paid a lot of attention to it. Okay. Yeah, so, OK, so the main point here that Maron is giving is that, um, uh, that we should make sure that we um, spend a lot of time you can give sort of equal uh, air time to the to the issues that can come yeah, up. Yeah. So, for example, I, potential negative impact. You know, once Oasis is up, for, so. I don't know what the the plans are for protecting it against a kind of 
maybe unintentional denial of service or attack or something by a large user who maybe doesn't have a, a web a web proxy or just directly accesses the central service. Uh, right, so it's the server itself, not the compute site. Uh, right. You could also imagine a user job comes in and does a fine slash, you know, and reads every file. Does it, let's say it does a file on, on every file so that it ends up having to read every file and you're you, you going to then use up all your fill up your cache. That's interesting. Um, in fact, uh, one of the things that I encountered with setting up the Atlas environment through Parrot was at one point it was searching for a particular Python version. And it was doing a find on a directory, which I think basically took a setup that was, you know, just, you know, a few milliseconds or, you know, just really quick at the command line if you were mounted, you know, if you were doing this normally from a uh, from a shell attached to CBMFS to 10 minutes. And I suspect, I mean, we've, uh, so Chandra and I have hunted this down mm -hmm. a bit, and we found that there was a find command going on. Yeah, so the repository can perhaps be, that was what was going generally on. Generally, the files are all packaged into one catalog, um, but the repository can be subdivided into subcatalogs for efficiency, so that if somebody doesn't access a certain portion of the namespace, um, all the information about it doesn't need to be downloaded. But if somebody does a find at the top level, then it's going to have to download all the subcatalogs as well. OK. OK. All right. Uh, do we have any further questions? Okay, thanks again to Dan for an excellent talk. Uh, our next uh, OSG CIC webinar will be, is tentatively set for January 25th. And the focus of that meeting will be about um, high throughput access uh, networking issues uh, for applications requiring high throughputs. Okay, thanks Bye. everybody again for joining. And uh, happy holidays.